So we're continuing this sermon series, it's called Under Construction, and we've been operating under the basic assumption that as Christians, and really as human beings, but especially as Christians, we are all under construction. Our lives are under construction. We are always trying to to do better. Just as our church building is under construction and we've worked hard to dig and blast a huge hole at the uh, south end of the building, I would make the case that there are things in all of our hearts and all of our lives that God would like to dig out, that God would like to remove so that better things can be put in there. There are certain uh, behaviors, certain sins, certain flaws that we need to work on and replace those things with something better. But as we know, this is not an easy process. Change, in general, is not an easy process. We all struggle with it. Sometimes we don't accept the fact that we need to change. Sometimes we push back on it. But God is calling us to do better. To begin this morning, I'd like to describe two different kinds of Christianity. And this may be an oversimplification, but I want you to at least hear me out. The first kind of Christianity that I'm going to Uh, describe, I'm going to call cultural Christianity. This category has been summarized before by the phrase, good people go to church. Uh, Cultural Christianity is not necessarily a bad thing. This type of Christian believes in God. They want to live a good life. They want to give back. They want to make a difference. Most of them have been baptized either as an infant or as an adult. They will tell you that their faith is important. They will tell you that they love their church, even if they don't make it very often. Most of them want to raise their children in the church and teach them the the ways of of Jesus. They will support the church and, and give back, although maybe not sacrificially. Some cultural Christians may even end up holding leadership positions, and they will use their gifts and their talents whenever they are called upon. Cultural Christians are often born into a Christian family or raised in a Christian home. They never really strayed from that. It's always been important, even if sometimes other priorities will uh, take precedence. Cultural Christians have a strong moral sense. They, they know right from wrong. They are familiar with the, the teachings of Jesus Uh, They may even know the Apostles' Creed by heart, and they can memorize it along with with other scriptures. When you're a pastor and you run into a cultural Christian somewhere in public, they might look at you and say, oh, I'm so sorry, I haven't been to church in a while. We've had so much going on in our lives. We've been so busy. I always respond and say, well, you know where to find us when when you want to come back. Cultural Christianity... Uh, is often marked by devotional life or some type of a prayer life, even if it's infrequent. These uh, types of Christians will certainly ask God for help when they need it. And many cultural Christians would say that they are doing their best. But life is busy, and life is hard, and life is stressful, and there's a lot going on. And Sundays, you know, sometimes Sundays are the only day that you can just relax and and be with family. But we know that that there are things that are competing for our time and for our attention. That's cultural Christianity. And it's not a judgment. It's just a category, okay? Now let me describe a second type of Christianity. And I'm going to call this authentic discipleship. Authentic discipleship is what I believe Jesus Christ is calling all of us to do. Authentic discipleship is marked by a realization that being a dedicated follower of Jesus is anything but easy and convenient. It is marked by a realization that ongoing spiritual formation is absolutely necessary. But it takes discipline and it takes intentionality. Authentic discipleship means that we are constantly examining our own lives and we are asking, what is Christ asking of me? What is Christ calling me to do and to be and to change? How can I do better? How can I serve and help others? Authentic discipleship means embracing spiritual disciplines like regular worship 
and prayer and reading scripture and reflecting and journaling and, and sacrificial giving. It also involves naming and facing our shortcomings and character flaws, which as I've been talking about this month, I think the Enneagram is a, uh, an amazing tool to help all of us uh, do that. At the end of the day, authentic discipleship is a lifelong journey that must be taken seriously. It cannot be done half-heartedly or every now and then. It's an ongoing process. It, it's, a, it's something that we commit to and we work on, not just on Sundays, but every single day, Sunday through Saturday, and then starting on Sunday again. And there are a couple scripture readings that come from the Gospels that I think if you're a, uh, focusing on authentic discipleship, you can hone in on these passages. One of them is our Gospel reading this morning from Matthew 16. Jesus says, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will find it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world but forfeit their life? And what can they give in return for their life? See, Jesus is making it clear that following him means you can't live on the world's terms. The spiritual life is different, and there will always be opportunities to sell your soul just about everywhere you turn. The next passage is John chapter 8, where Jesus says, If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. What does this mean? You want to experience true freedom in life? You want to be liberated from the things that hold you back and that keep you down? Then follow the words and teachings of Jesus and you will be set free. Be honest with yourself and with others and you will be set free. And many of us know that we live lives of bondage, that we are tied up by many things and we would like to be set free, but often we feel like we just can't get to that point. But we want to be set free, but yet sometimes we feel like we have not been. Third passage from John 13. I give you a new commandment that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you should also love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. I believe that these three passages of scripture can ground us in a life of spiritual formation and can show us the spiritual way of Jesus. Now in the book that I've recommended to go along with this series, A.J. Sherrill says this, spiritual formation tends to be generalistic and overly simplistic. Attend church on Sunday, read the Bible, pray and give to the local church. That's the extent of the vision that many churches have for transforming the human soul. But this is simply not enough. All of that is good, all of that is necessary, but it's not enough. Caring for your soul and becoming more like Christ involves so much more than that. And the Enneagram will help you know yourself, understand yourself, give you a starting point for spiritual growth and transformation. Henry Nouwen raises these questions at the beginning of his book called Spiritual Formation. He says, after many years of seeking to live a spiritual life, I still ask myself, where am I as a Christian? How far have I advanced? Do I love God more now than earlier in my life? Have I matured in faith since I started on the spiritual path? He says, many of the struggles of 20 or 40 years ago are still very much with me. I am still searching for inner peace and for creative relationships with others and for a deeper experience of God. One of the challenges of spiritual formation is that it never ends. And this world has a way of throwing us off track. What do I mean by that? Well, there are many obstacles 
to the spiritual life. And we all know this. And I think naming them is important. Last week we talked about three of them, anger, shame, and fear. But let's add to the list. What are the things that keep us from spiritual formation, that keep us from authentic discipleship, that keep us from being more like Christ in our words and in our actions? Anger, shame, fear, I would add busyness. Being busy in our culture is a mark that you are important, that you have a lot going on, that you are needed by many people. But the truth is, busyness is often the way that we run from having to face ourselves. If we can stay on the treadmill of busyness, then we never have to do the hard inner work. We never have to slow down and face ourselves and look within our own hearts. We have a, um, a center for healing and spirituality. It's in the, the old parsonage, Campbell West. And, and Ben Curtis is a retired professor from Belmont. He's the director of that center. And I've gone to Ben uh, over the last couple years for some sessions on spiritual direction. But I'm going to tell you how I sometimes feel when I would do spiritual direction. I'd sit there with Ben and there might be a candle lit and we might start in silence and, and, and he would say, you know, let me know what you want to talk about. And I would look out the window and I'd see Woodmont and I'd start thinking of all the things that I needed to be doing that afternoon. And I'm wondering, why am I here being quiet and still when I've got all this stuff going on at the church that I need to take care of? But the truth of the matter is, if I could sit there and be still and silent and pray and reflect, I would be much more effective at all the stuff that I have to get done at the church. But lots of times we don't do this because we're busy and we stay busy. And being busy is a way to avoid having to do the difficult inner work. What about responsibilities? We all have responsibilities in our jobs, in our marriages, with our children, with our families. You know, just taking care of things that we're supposed to do can, can be an obstacle to spiritual growth. The things that called me into the ministry, a desire to preach and teach and counsel and write, that's not necessarily the things that I spend all of my time doing. Administration is not necessarily spiritual. Handling conflicts is not necessarily spiritual. Managing a construction project is definitely not necessarily spiritual. But these are the responsibilities that we have. And we all have things that we have to do that can wear us out on a regular basis and that can drain our energy and that can keep us from growing spiritually. And then there's conflict. We know that there are people in life who just like to fight and they're always creating conflict. And usually it says more about what's going on in their own heart than it does about any particular issue. People can project their inner turmoil and their dissatisfaction onto other people. It happens all the time. But here's the truth. Conflict gets old and fighting gets old. And that's not very spiritual. What about ego? Wanting our lives to matter. Wanting to be important, that can quickly turn into wanting others to recognize how great we are. We want to be significant, and then we, we feel like if, if we're ignored or overlooked, we get offended so easily. If we're not thanked for what we do, we, we, we can't believe that somebody didn't notice it. But learning humility is a way to tame the ego. And then there's grief. Loss of a family member or loss of a loved one. Loss of a marriage or, or, or loss of a life that we used to have but we no longer have. This can make spiritual growth really, really difficult. There are so many obstacles to the spiritual life, but I would argue that's exactly why we need the spiritual life. It's exactly why it's so important because living in this world and living in this culture is anything but easy. But Jesus says, in this world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. Paul describes the marks of the Christian life in Romans this way, and I love this passage. I come back to it so often in my own uh, devotional life. Paul says, let love be genuine. Hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good. 
Love one another with mutual affection. I'll do one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal. Be ardent in spirit and serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in suffering. Persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. And then Paul says this. He says, if it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. It's one of my favorite passages because it describes what the Christian life looks like. But nobody said that it's easy. In fact, it's hard. It's hard to follow Jesus. It's hard to stay spiritually centered and focused on him in a world that for the most part is not. For many years, uh, Harvey Cox taught a class at Harvard University. And the class was, was called Jesus in the Moral Life. And the class was so popular that it had to be moved uh, into an auditorium. And Cox later published his reflections from that class in a book called When Jesus Came to Harvard. And he found that there was general consensus that Jesus was a first century Palestinian Jew who lived under the heel of Roman occupation. He taught about the imminent coming of the kingdom of God, and he gained a strong following as a teacher and a healer in Galilee, especially among the landless and the peasants. He ended up making the religious ruling class nervous, and he caused quite a stir when he entered Jerusalem during the Passover. Ultimately, he was arrested and he was executed, but as his followers, they became convinced that he appeared to them alive and raised from the dead. Well, in reflecting on Jesus' life, Cox says this. He says, meeting him always seemed to shake people up. He constantly pushed them to think beyond their own immediate interests, to picture themselves in a variety of situations in which choice and action were required. Jesus also put people in uncomfortable situations by the way that he lived. He violated the social and religious taboos of his day. He ate with people that a respectable rabbi was not supposed to eat with. He kept company with shady characters and social deviants. He lived in such a way that anyone who encountered him had to re-examine the meaning of life and look at the world from a new point of view. We know that many Christians today try to monopolize Jesus and they try to put him in a box. They try to claim that they've figured him out once and for all and they know everything about him. But the truth of the matter is we will spend a lifetime coming to know this amazing man from Nazareth who has transformed the world and our understanding of God we will spend a lifetime reflecting upon the, the Sermon on the Mount and studying the parables and being challenged by his teachings and being dazzled at his healings and pondering what it means to welcome the kingdom of God into our hearts and into our lives. Because remember, if the kingdom of God does not start in your own heart, then it doesn't start anywhere. And as soon as we think that we have him figured out, he turns our lives upside down and he opens our eyes and our hearts again. You see, friends, the invitation is always there to move from cultural Christianity to authentic transformational discipleship, which requires spiritual formation, which requires work on our part. But many are not up for it because it takes work and it takes intentionality. But remember this, once you get to know Jesus Christ and once you pattern your life after what he taught and how he lived, he will not leave you the same again. Amen.